In, in December 2017, a book appeared with the curious title, The Last Man Who Knew Everything. A subtitle revealed that it's a biography of Enrico Fermi, a longtime professor of physics at the University of Chicago. And the preface revealed that by everything, the author meant everything about physics. <laughs> As should be clear by now, Fermi was not the man, last man who knew everything. The holder of that title is in this room, and his preface probably should say, the last man who knew everything except physics. <laughs> Unfortunately, a large segment of the legal academy and the bar believes that judges know everything and can put the world to rights. Richard Epstein has made a great career of showing that that obviously false proposition <laughs> is indeed false, and then working out the implications, such as what simple rules fit a complex world in which both legislators and judges have severe deficits of information and poor incentives to do the right thing. The answer would be easy if decentralized markets could handle all transactions, as Hayek thought, but markets are costly. It's always essential to compare the cost of markets against the cost of government. This panel explores the implications of Richard's work for health care, financial products, private information exchange, contracting. This is getting pretty close to everything just on one panel. Uh, the presenters are David Hyman of Georgetown, Seth Orenberg of Duquesne, and Anup Milani of the University of Chicago. The details are in your program. I don't want to take time away from them. Let's get to the good stuff. So good morning. Uh, it's a real pleasure uh, to be here and uh, to say nice things about Richard, of which there is no shortage of nice things to be said. Um, I'm talking about uh, Epstein on health law and policy, uh, including malpractice. Uh, if you asked a random group of law professors uh, list the fields for which Richard is sort of best known as a prominent uh, scholar, uh, public intellectual, uh, Twitter uh, generator. Uh, it's very unlikely that health law and policy would make the list. Um, there are all sorts of other things that uh, leap to mind. Uh, but uh, in 2012, uh, NYU Law Magazine published uh, this infographic, uh, which is short of uh, the full-blown statistical analysis that we've seen recently. So I I'm pleased to see that NYU is upping its game. Uh, but uh, the striking thing is if you look among the things that are closest uh, is uh, healthcare right here. Uh, and there's something about uh, what was Justice Roberts thinking. Uh, and there's also uh, contraception uh, and uh, so on and so on. Uh, and so there's at least some evidence that word is getting out. And what do I mean by that? I mean that, in fact, uh, if you look at Richard's productivity, I'm not so good at reading, but I'm really good at counting things. Uh, and uh, it, so what I did was I took uh, Richard's CV and I identified the articles that uh, one way or another involved uh, health law and policy, which is actually a pretty expansive field. And then I just uh, plotted it across uh, a series of 10-year periods over uh, his uh, basically 50-year teaching career. Uh, and what you find out very quickly is, first of all, he's got 63 articles um, uh, and book chapters. Uh, and it's important to note that that ex excludes a whole category, ca categories of things on his CV. So I didn't count occasional papers, book reviews, newspaper columns, blogs, and magazine pieces. Uh, if I did, uh, the bolds on the right would be much more pronounced. Uh, and it's, frankly, it was such an extensive list that his CV was not complete at the time that I requested it. Uh, to do that, and I also excluded uh, the two books that he's written on health law and policy. Uh, if you want to add those in, uh, you have to figure out an exchange rate between articles and books, but nonetheless, uh, what you discover is, first of all, this is a huge volume of work. It's actually about 12% of his total output. Uh, the healthcare system takes up about 18% of our GDP. Uh, so. Richard, for all his legendary productivity, can't keep up with the healthcare system. Uh, he's obviously trying towards the end of his career, as you see, or towards the latter part of his career, excuse me. Um, what you also see is that basically uh, splitting the first half and the second half uh, of uh, this time period, 
75% uh, of his work on helpful on policy comes in the second half, so there's been a real ramping up. Uh, and this is against a baseline of the really extraordinary productivity uh, in other dimensions. Now, the other important point is to ask, well, okay, this is a lot of stuff, but what uh, subjects is he covering? Um, in addition to the two books that I'll just show you the covers of, one of which appeared in 97, the other in 06. Uh, and if you look at the subject areas, and I sort of coded and subdivided them using what I think are fairly conventional uh, buckets, uh, the last column on the right shows uh, the share of the 63 articles that is over the entire 50-year period. Uh, and so the top three, medical malpractice, bioethics, privacy, and IRBs, and FDA basically account for almost 75% of his work, uh, but there's also health reform, general health law, and policy, and public health. And if you then ask what share of articles on those subjects were in the first half of his career versus the second half, I keep saying career, I apologize, the first 25 years versus the second 25 years, uh, that's the uh, third column over. Uh, so. Medical malpractice, uh, he basically is splitting evenly half in the first half, half in the second half, but FDA and prescription drugs uh, and health reform and public health are all towards the last 25 years. So some continuing interests and some relatively new interests which account for a sizable amount of productivity. So lots of subjects, lots of things. How did this happen? Well. Um, as we heard last night, uh, Richard's father was a physician, uh, but he lacked some physical dexterity issues, so he went into law. Um, and then, obviously, as a tort scholar, he gravitated first to medical malpractice, so his first four articles in this space were actually about medical malpractice, including one in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is very hard for anyone to do, let alone a law professor. Um, <laughs> Um, and also, uh, an important figure is uh, Mark Siegler, who's here in the audience, who founded the Center for Clinical Medical Ethics, uh, which Richard became associated with uh, in 1983 and has been sort of continuously involved with ever since then. If I was asked to identify an inflection point, it's probably around 1991 when he published an article in the Kansas Law Review entitled, Why is uh, healthcare special, uh, and then that really continued to be develop into the first the mortal peril book that I showed you the picture of, uh, and then spun off into further work involving lots of issues. Now I'm going to focus, given the breadth of subjects that were covered, on three big issues: medical malpractice, pharmaceuticals, and health reform. Uh, as I said a moment ago, Richard's first articles in health law and policy were on this subject. Although he's a tort law scholar, he took the fairly straightforward position, completely unconventional, what a shock, that contract was the solution to medical malpractice, that patients and physicians and patients in healthcare institutions ought to be able to negotiate their own agreements as to whether there would be full liability rights, limited rights, no rights whatsoever, scheduled damages, open-ended reimbursement of economic, but not of non-economic. You can spell out all of the different possibilities. And the insight that drove this was that patients and physicians are not strangers to one another. The tort law is designed for stranger interaction, but when you're dealing with friends or counterparties, you can use contract to allocate risks, costs, and benefits much more sensibly. Um, and uh, as I said a few moments ago, Richard has articulated this repeatedly over the course of his career with no success whatsoever. As he himself acknowledges, there, uh, no one basically has taken him up on, no state has been willing to take him up on this approach. There have been some attempts by individual providers to do uh, such things as adopting alternative dispute resolution agreements. California um, has uh, accepted that as long as the disparities in bargaining power um, uh, don't cause them to take too much offense as, as in addition, if the healthcare provider is running a rotten system for resolving these disputes, the courts tend to get a little bit uh, upset as well. Uh, so this is an a relatively rare example, I think, of uh, a, a very sensible Epstinian approach that has had no takers whatsoever. Uh, and Richard... <laughs> 
uh, uh, Richard acknowledges this. I think the, the question that is worth asking about it is, uh, compared to what, is there really the same demand for this now as there might have been in the mid-1970s? And I want to highlight a couple of things. First, we've got caps on damages that have been adopted in 30-some states. Uh, we've got lots of providers doing apology programs. We have ADR uh, as well. And then the last thing I want to highlight on this is uh, this is data from the National Practitioner Data Bank. The frequency of paid med mal claims has been declining steadily since we started collecting data in the early 1990s, uh, declining particularly impressively since 2000. We're now at a rate of paid mal med mal claims that's about 25% of what it was when we first started collecting data. So maybe some of the pressure is off on contractual solutions. So I think uh, rather than view this as a defeat, you can view this as an alternative market workaround uh, to the problem. Um, so that's MedMal. What about pharma? Well, we heard a little bit about pharma yesterday. Uh, there, there's lots of criticism of the pharmaceutical industry, lots of concern about high prices and ineffective drugs. Uh, and not much concern with the sort of basic economics of pharmaceutical innovation and the complications of designing reimbursement systems. Uh, lots of criticism of the FDA for being too strict, some criticism of it for being not strict enough. Uh, Richard's approach, which is articulated uh, in the over, uh, overdose book that I showed you the picture of a moment ago, uh, starts from a very different perspective and reaches very different conclusions. Uh, it was the target of a exceptionally harsh review by uh, an editor of the New England Journal of Medicine um, and never one to take criticism lightly. Richard uh, wrote his own extensive response uh, dismantling uh, the criticisms that had been made. Uh, my piece actually includes an extended excerpt from uh, the exchange. Uh, I encourage everybody to read both of them because you see uh, Richard at the top of his game. Um, beating up on the poor editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, who is off, often wrong but never in doubt. Um, so the last issue I wanted to talk about uh, was health reform. Uh, Richard's uh, burst of productivity coincided with two separate attempts to do national health reform. Uh, Hillary Care, as it's sometimes called, and Obamacare. Uh, the, a uh, mortal peril book was published in the wake of the failure of an attempt to enact national health reform by the Clinton administration. Uh, and the whole series of articles that were on health reform were a sort of real-time response to the debates over Obamacare and the implementation, <coughs> shall we say, challenges uh, that have been experienced. Um, Richard's position, uh, consistent with his other work, is that attempts of this sort are doomed to failure because they contravene core Hayekian insights about the complications of organizing and running uh, social systems that interlock with one another where local knowledge is very important and incentives are important and setting general policy from the center tends not to work out very well. Uh, his perspective uh, was summarized, I think, in the title of an article that I was lucky enough to be the co-author on um, called Fixing Obamacare, the Virtues of Choice, Competition, and Deregulation. Um, not surprisingly, the people who uh, were uh, responsible for designing Obamacare had little interest in this particular set of proposals, not much in choice, except as they chose to define it, no real interest in competition, uh, and they feared de deregulation above all else. Um, and, you know, we see the consequences around us, lots of workarounds, government by waiver, government by blog post, uh, ad hoc improvisation, um, and an attempt to get past the next news cycle. Um, John Gruber at MIT said, explained that, quote, the lack of transparency is a huge political advantage in pushing legislation like this through. Um, Richard uh, had a different take on it. He said, this is one, another of those schemes that are dumber than anything you can imagine. <laughs> so uh, if I was to summarize uh, Richard's uh, overall perspective, it actually comes from a talk that he gave at Mark's uh, 2008 Fish Shrift here in the law school, uh, and it's that medicine is just too important to be left to doctors, just as war 
offer is too important to be left to generals. It's fine to let them treat patients. That's why they go to medical school. Uh, but asking them to uh, develop and implement the kinds of complicated structures that are necessary uh, to deal with a sector of the economy that is not only huge, but touches everyone's lives at their most vulnerable points. Uh, you, you basically have this difficult combination of both arrogance and incompetence uh, that causes things not to work out as even its most enthusiastic sponsors hoped for. So with that, I will end. Thank you very much. For some reason, the mouse is not going over. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you to the organizers for putting this panel together, honoring the life and work of Richard Epstein. I really owe my scholarly life to Richard Epstein. When I came to the University of Chicago, I asked him to supervise my paper, and he said, you should consider a career in Roman law. <laughs> I, I chose to go my own way and focus instead on entrepreneurship and, and future law, yet here, somehow, I am. And fortunately, I'm also here with my co-author, Leah Palagashvili. She's an economics uh, professor at State University of New York Purchase. And she focuses her research on the same thing. So we actually make a great team. And more so, right? And, and in fact, it was Richard who, who noticed that and who put us together. And so, uh, Richard, you've been a mentor to both of us. You helped us jumpstart our careers, jumpstart our research, get a grant. And that grant is starting to bear fruit in the terms of some scholarly work one aspect of which I'm delighted to share with Richard and with you today. Our paper, The Gig Economy, Smart Contracts, and the Disruption of Traditional Work Arrangements is about how new technologies change labor relationships, specifically gig economy platforms and blockchain smart contracts reduce transaction costs and thereby disrupt the traditional employer-employee relationship and lead, we believe, to more freelance work or more contracting out. In fact, smart contracts are self-enforcing, which especially lowers transactions costs and makes markets more frictionless. Thus, technology may lead to a world with decentralized work that mirrors the fundamentals of contract at will employment that Richard would probably like to see. In fact, you may argue that Richard argued persuasively in defense of the contract at will in a 1984 University of Chicago law review paper. So many of you here today may be pleased to know that technology will accomplish what regulation failed to do. Today we'll discuss some of the latest technological developments that are changing the way people work. So please let me begin by saying a few words of explanation about the gig economy and blockchain smart contracts. Gig economy platforms are apps on your smartphone, usually, that connect people who want services to people who need them on an on-demand basis for the most part. For example, Uber is an app that connects people who want a ride and people who want to give a ride. TaskRabbit is an app that connects handymen and homeowners. Airbnb connects property owners and renters. Handy connects maids with, you know, people who have dirty dishes. So in general, <laughs> these apps connect service providers and customers by making what economists call a two-sided market. Next comes smart contracts. Smart contracts promise to further transform how people work. A smart contract is really a misnomer. It doesn't involve any real intelligence, not even artificial intelligence. A smart contract is just a computer program that runs on a virtual machine in the blockchain. So we're all clear on that, right? Can move on? <laughs> OK, I will briefly try to unpack this, starting with what is the blockchain. Smart contracts run on blockchain platforms. So I will explain the blockchain first. In its simplest form, a blockchain is a sort of distributed digital ledger, which can record transactions in a resilient and tamper-proof way. The digital ledger is organized into time-stamped pages called blocks. Each block contains information about transactions that occurred during a set time period. These transactions are pseudonymous, which I can't pronounce, but I understand to mean it is easy to see that X7561G sent 0 0.002 bitcoins to A32PD at 10.10 10 a.m. on October 10th. So we have a record of that transaction, but we don't know who A32PD really is. 
And this is a type of blockchain called a public blockchain that is open to anyone. Anyone can participate as a member on a network like this. Copies of the blockchain's digital ledger are stored on members' computers around the world. And members agree on the validity of that ledger at set time intervals through a process called consensus. At the conclusion of each time interval, a subset of the members who are called miners will use an algorithm to convert the transaction record for that time period into a shorter cryptic data value called a hash. Basically, any amount of information can be converted into a hash value. And this fact became very salient when I was invited to this conference. And lacking the time to read all of Richard's work, I took his 68-page curriculum vitae and converted it to a 32-bit hash value, which I was able to read much more quickly. For example, the hash value of the words Richard A. Period Epstein using the CRC32 process is, drum roll please, B12F44A6. <laughs> but it is important to understand that even a small change, even a small change in the input will result in a large and unpredictable change to the output. For example, the hash value of Richard Epstein without the middle initial but using the same process is 37DF6E48. And the value of that CEV I referenced earlier, which was quite a bit easier to read than all the papers on it, was 0A787392. And so we see that the amount of information on the input side does not matter. You end up with the same amount of information, 32 bits, on the output side. And also note that even though uh, the output values have different number of characters, input values have different number of characters, the output values are the same. And note that be even though the input values in the first case are quite similar, the output values of B12F44A6 and 37DF6E48 are completely different. And this turns out to really matter because they differ in a completely unpredictable way. And so this characteristic of the hash function, that it's very hard to know what you'll get out of this black box when you put it in the system, is actually why blockchain works and how digital letters, ledgers are pretty much tamper-proof. In the case of the blockchain system, the system has a rule that the hash value of the entire block that is created must actually have a special characteristic as well. And so all of, these, uh, all of this information that happened during a set period is collected into a block and then a hash value is created for that block that must start with a number of leading zeros. So while hashing was a relatively easy process, I was able to find those three things very quickly, finding a hash that has a certain number of leading zeros is actually quite hard. And so the process of mining is essentially a guessing game where you add random data to the block until it returns a hash with those special characteristics. And it may take hundreds, thousands, or millions of attempts before the result is a hash with these characteristics. This process is very expensive because it requires a lot of computer hardware and takes a lot of electricity. But once a specific hash is found and a miner broadcasts it to the network, it is easy for everyone else to see if the hash works. It's verifiable. Moreover, that hash becomes the first value in the next block, and so the blocks begin to form a chain, hence the name blockchain. Now this is also very important because a block cannot be changed unless the hash value of the prior block is also changed because that information is encoded in the subsequent block. As I mentioned, it's very expensive to find even one hash with these special characteristics. It is vastly more expensive to find multiple hash values for specific hash uh, with these characteristics for an entire chain. As a result, it is generally economically, financially inefficient to falsify a blockchain and much more efficient to verify it. In this way, blockchain technology develops a digital record that's permanent, decentralized, and self-verifying. Blockchain 1.0 technology that I just described has many applications, not just for cryptography, but also for clearing financial transactions, recording property rights, and many other things that can be done cheaper and faster on a blockchain. The technology meets certain use cases where the goal is creating an indelible record of historical transactions, but it's also limited. Now that was 1.0. Bitcoin, for example, runs on a 1.0 blockchain, but the technology has progressed since 2008 when Bitcoin began. Newer blockchain networks, like Ethereum, can also encode computer programs called smart contracts on these distributed ledgers, and that's where things start to get really interesting. The Ethereum network adds a critical feature that could have far, far more far-ranging implications. 
Ethereum added contract accounts, and anyone on an Ethereum network can send a message to a contract account in order to create a conditional transaction where a payment or other transaction occurs contingent upon a future event. For example, take our old friend A32PD. A32PD sends a message to the Ethereum contract account, which contains a computer program saying if Bruce picks up Pat on the intersection of State and Wacker and drives him to 55th and Woodlawn, one Ether is transferred from Pat to Bruce. The Ethereum virtual machine will automatically determine this has happened based on things like GPS data, and it will automatically transfer the cryptocurrency and service and uh, payment for the service. There is absolute certainty the contract will be performed if the pre-programmed uh, pre conditions are achieved. So there is no concept of breach, and there is no need for courts to determine post facto whether parties performed. There is also no setting aside of smart contracts because of traditional reasons like a failure of consideration, misrepresentation, or a violation of public policy. And these transactions are anonymous, or at least uh, pseudonymous. Parties can agree to whatever they want, and the contract will be automatically enforced so long as the performance occurs. So the result of smart contracts is something very much like a contract at will. Now, with that background in mind, what does economic theory predict will change because of the gig economy and smart contracts? To understand how these technologies are influencing work, we apply transaction cost economics. That was first developed by Ronald Coase in his seminal article, The Nature of the Firm, and expanded by uh, Alchain, Demses, Williamson, and others. Coase, as you know, recognized that the higher cost of transacting with the market, the greater the advantage of organizing a firm. Conversely, as transactions costs decrease, firms will tend to shrink and use market systems instead. There are a number of transactions costs identified in the literature and discussed more fully in the paper, but in the interest of time, I'll discuss just two with you today. Monitoring costs and uncertainty of performance. How are these factors impacted by gig economy platforms and smart contracts? First, monitoring costs will be greatly reduced by both of these technologies. For example, platforms use autonomous surveys, aggregation of reviews, GPS tracking, and real-time feedback to determine whether a worker is performing, and smart contracts add crowdsourcing and big data analysis to determine how performance is going. These developments have led to easier measurement of worker output without needing a manager or direct oversight. Much of the transactions cost economics literature says that reduced monitoring costs will lead to more contracting out, but that's not the entire story. If, trend, if technology reduces the monitoring of inputs, then technology may actually uh, utilize greater employment contracts. Consider, for example, GPS tracking. Logistics firms preferred to contract out trucking services to drivers who own and operate their own vehicles because firms could not tell if trucks were driven well or driven badly. And so they didn't want to have their trucks driven badly. But GPS allowed firms to monitor if trucks were driven well. And so firms became more willing to employ drivers to drive company-owned trucks because of this technology. If blockchain technology, such as smart contracts, reduce the cost of monitoring inputs, this could lead firms who care about how a job is done to staff up. Secondly, uncertainty of performance will also be reduced because these monitoring technologies make performance more measurable. In addition, platforms can reduce the cost of non-performance by holding funds in escrow and employing rating systems that automatically discipline non-performance. Smart contracts use all of these tools and moreover, the smart contract automatically issues payment for performance, minimizing chances for opportunistic behavior. The blockchain virtual machine makes it a virtual certainty that non-performance will be punished automatically. Thus, reducing uncertainty of individual performance will generally lead, lead to more contracting out. If an employee at a firm does not perform, a firm's manager can discipline that employee relatively cheaply. But if an independent contractor does not perform, the firm may need to resort to courts. And courts, as we know, are expensive. Therefore, to the extent that smart contracts are truly self-enforcing, and parties do not get a second bite at the apple by litigating to rescind smart contracts, the ability to easily punish non-performance of independent contractors will also lead to more contracting out. Thus, in our paper, we identify how the technological developments of gig economy platforms and blockchain smart contracts reduce the cost of transacting both inside and outside the firm. But we generally find that gig platforms and smart contracts reduce the relative cost of transacting out. In other words, the gig economy platforms and blockchain smart contracts reduce the cost of transacting in the market, so we should expect to see an increase in freelance and contract work and a diminution in the overall size of the firm. 
But some aspects of these technologies have countervailing effects. Although the data show there is a general shift toward contracting out, a conservative estimate is that 15.8% of the labor force today engages in gig, contract, or freelance work as their main source of income. And over 50% of the US workforce engages in freelancing as part of their income. Now, as proper obsidian students, we recognize that the correct way to understand this problem is by focusing on Roman law. <laughs> I mean, technology and innovation. Since theory and data indicate that contract work will increase and firms will shrink, we further argue that our contract labor laws do not properly account for how people work today and how they will work in the future. Because benefits are tied to employers, labor regulations are overlooking how workers are now becoming more contract-based and how they will continue to be so as the traditional employee-employer relationship dissipates. In other words, we argue that labor regulation needs to allow portable benefit solutions. These portable benefit solutions are already emerging in the market. Companies like Honest Dollar and Nastana are providing competitive 401k <laughs> retirement plans to contractors and freelancers. Health insurance should also be decoupled from a single <coughs> employer in the same manner. As workers increasingly work for many firms instead of just one, the benefits of work need to be unbundled so that each firm can craft the benefits that workers want to receive from that work. Our normative conclusion, therefore, based on our research, is that due to technological developments of gig economy platforms and smart contracts, in addition to other reasons why firms are contracting out instead of staffing up, as Richard and others have pointed out, that employment benefits need to become portable and unbundled. Thank you. Just fine. Thanks. Okay. You gotta show this picture. Oh yeah, I gotta do this. There we go. Otherwise it's only useful for me. No, now it's not there. Trees. No, I got it. Okay. I guess it's uh, only appropriate after uh, your talk for, for us to show you what the average level of technology competence is in this room. Uh, okay. So I want to uh, um, talk a little bit about mortal peril. So this is uh, 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 Richard's book from the late 1990s talking about healthcare reform. It's part of the, uh, the move that he made in the, in the second 25 years, we're waiting for the third 25 to come, uh, the second 25 years to focus on, on healthcare reform. Uh, and unsurprisingly, probably to many in this room, he was skeptical uh, of, uh, of healthcare reform. At that point, it was Hillary Care. Um, and and uh, I think David captured it right. He was skeptical about centralized approaches uh, to this problem, thinking decentralized approaches were a little bit better uh, for the reasons that actually David uh, explained quite eloquently. Um, I agree with, Dave, uh, with, uh, with Richard uh, that public health insurance uh, isn't um, always the solution to the, to the healthcare woes that, that plague America. Um, uh, but I want to take a different tack at it. So I'm going to assume in this talk that, in fact, the central government, the US government, um, can actually do things well. OK? I'm going to assume that that's true. We're <laughs> <laughs> end up in the same place. Just another uh, uh, arrow for your quiver. Um, the problem is that even if they did it well, um, it, it's not the right answer. OK? And so that's the approach that I'm going to take. Basically, I'm going to give you different reasons uh, for why public health insurance is, is not should not be the focus of healthcare reform in America, despite it being the case an attempt in the 1990s under Hillary Care, and despite it being the, the core of uh, the Affordable Care Act of the what's called Obamacare today. And I'm going to try to do this by connecting you, walking you through the logic of uh, healthcare risk, uh, health risk actually, uh, healthcare pricing, uh, and then insurance, and then finally insurance pricing. Okay, and, and some of these things you might know, and some things you might just have intuitions about. Uh, but I will say this, uh, almost every step that we're going to take right now is not conventional wisdom uh, in uh, healthcare uh, policy, sadly not even in health economics. Okay, 
So my first point is going to be that innovation is more important uh, for tackling risk in the health sector uh, than is insurance. In order to understand this, you have to think about what is it uh, that constitutes risk uh, in health. And this is going to be really obvious. The risk is that you might get sick. Okay? Uh, this is really different than what happens in policy debates. In policy debates, people think the risk is that you have to pay for health care. That's not the risk. The thing that you care about is health. The thing that's risky is that you might get sick. Now, how should we think about this? Well, the first thing to think about is, let's suppose that you're in 1990 and you've got an HIV. Will health insurance help you? No, because there was no solution, medical solution to HIV. It was not until 1996 when heart, highly active uh, antiretroviral therapy came out, that you actually had a solution, okay? That's a very fundamental insight that we often don't teach in health economics. What does that mean? That means that when you get sick, um, what you have is a physical risk to your life. And it's a risk that you cannot insure without uh, a medical innovation. Okay? The thing that makes medical innovation super interesting from an economic perspective, from a risk perspective, is it takes what is a physical risk, your sickness, and converts it into a financial risk. What? A treatment that can cure your sickness, but you have to pay for it. Why is that an important step? I can't write a financial insurance contract on sickness, but I can write a financial insurance contract that helps me spread out the costs of having to pay for healthcare that treats that sickness. Does that make sense? Yes. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, there's a series of scholars, myself included, uh, that basically made this basic point uh, a few years ago. Uh, and then, what, what we proceeded to do, so uh, my co-authors in this were Dry Slokdawalla and Julian Rafe, also Chicago products. Uh, what we basically said is the following. Let's suppose that you have something like HIV. And let's suppose that uh, HIV is going to kill you before there's heart. Everybody follow my law, right? So in some sense, you can think of it. the risk of getting HIV is like a, a risk of facing a $100,000 loss, where $100,000, why did I pick it? It's picked it as a value of life for a particular year. Okay, value of statistical life, of one year statistical life. Okay, let's not quibble about that dollar amounts, it's just an example. So if I'm sitting there in 1990, I face a gamble every time I engage in risky sexual behavior or drug use or whatever, of a $100,000 gamble. I could lose $100,000 if I get HIV. And there's some probability of me getting HIV. Got it? Okay. What, uh, what happens in, in uh, and I can't insure that, right? I know this is a weird way to think about things, but this is what economists do, which is why we're not socially popular. <laughs> okay, so 1996 come along, comes along and heart comes out. And let's suppose heart uh, can, can convert my sickness into a financial cost, right? That I can write insurance on. And let's suppose I price heart at uh, $100,000. What have I done? I basically converted a $100,000 physical risk that's not insurable to a $100,000 financial risk that's insurable, which has value, by the way, because now I can buy insurance. So insurance derives value from the existence of a medical solution. Fair enough? There's a second thing, and by the way, that's one step. That's gonna be that second bullet point uh, that I've got uh, talking about willing to pay. Then there's a second thing that, that Hart does. So let's suppose instead of pricing Hart at $100,000, I price it at $15,000, which is closer to what's actually priced at. Medical innovation priced this way, priced below what the actual willingness to pay is, okay, actually does further insurance. Now I've taken a gamble that in 1990 was I could lose $100,000 or not, to a gamble in 1996 priced where I could lose $50,000 or not. And you'd rather play that second gamble. And then on top of that, you could insure the $15,000. Does that make sense? And you see in this example, not only was innovation necessary for the insurance, but in fact, it does a lot more risk reduction by making that lottery a lot less bad than insurance does, right? It kind of takes away $85,000 uh, $85, of the risk, uh, and insurance is only going to help you spread the range of 15000 Fair enough? So that's basically the idea. We basically make this point uh, in a 2015 article, and we actually look at about 1,700 uh, different cost effectiveness analysis studies and show what is the average benefit that you're getting from the innovation versus health insurance, and I really should go back to calling this health care insurance, in terms of reducing your risk. This is a table I'm not going to spend a lot of time explaining. All I want to do is look at the middle row. So we look at the average, like the average risk aversion. So obviously this is really more valuable if you're risk averse. Uh, if, you're, if you have average risk aversion in the economy, uh, what you find is that the physical risk reduction that you get from health insurance, uh, sorry, from uh, innovation across these 1,700 different technologies is about $800. 
per person. Whereas if you look at the value of the risk spreading that you get from health care insurance per person, it's $45. In terms of risk reduction, innovation is, has, has 20 times more value than uh, healthcare insurance. And that's assuming you fully insure, and we know we don't do that. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's point number one. Innovation is what el eliminates risk. Health insurance does too, but it's secondary. It's dependent on healthcare innovation and does a lot less of it empirically in the economy. Okay? And by the way, this was true before the ACA. Okay, second thing. Public health insurance expansions, they don't really control financial risk, okay, from healthcare prices. They're not critical. So let me give you a puzzle. Everybody talks about how we need healthcare. If you look, read the public literature, you read the New England Journal, they'll tell you if you need, if you want to reduce, improve health, give people health insurance. It's not true. The best studies to date have not found health benefits from health insurance. Take the RAND health insurance experiment done back in the late 70s, early 80s. You take another really amazing study called the Oregon Health Insurance Experiment done by Kate Baker, who's now the dean at Harris, uh, and, and Amy Finkelstein, one of the uh, uh, Bates Park winning uh, health economists. No health benefits. In fact, if you were honest and you, if you, you could give a health economist a truth serum, I think what you basically find is they've been trying for a long time to find health benefits from health insurance, and they haven't been super successful. Yeah, you can find some studies, but there are a lot of null results. Okay, I just finished a large health insurance experiment in India, 55,000 people, null results. Okay, meaning you're not getting a big impact on health. And the reason, at least in the US, why this is the case, the answer in India is different. The reason in the US is what we don't realize is that people have alternative ways of insuring themselves even without public health insurance. And I don't mean private health insurance. They've got three different approaches. Some of them statutory, some of them not. The first one is themselves. They can save money, it's called precautionary savings for, for hospitalization, or they can borrow. And in fact, the ability to do that has expanded over time. One of the nice things about credit cards and credit markets in the United States developing over the last 30, 40 years is you can do that. Okay, maybe you don't like that, we don't like debt. Okay, fine. You've got a second approach, that is particularly for poor people who might be worried. A second approach that's really important is EMTALA. So this is a 1986 statute that says if you are a Medicare providing hospital, you have to, basically it used to be for just ERs, but if somebody presents themselves in an ER and now in the hospital anywhere, you have to basically treat them first, bill them later. You can bill them, but you have to treat them first. By the way, this is not, this is not obviously the way you do things. In India, it's the other way around. You show up with a broken arm, you don't have the money, they can turn you, up, they can turn you away. So that's the second thing. Which means that no matter what, you can get the treatment, you just might have bills later. Now, of course, you say, oh boy, I'm worried about those bills, especially for poor people. But we have another thing. We have a statutory safety net, another one, which is bankruptcy. Okay? And bankruptcy, uh, 